Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have with us Paul Venner joining us here today in the studio as you can see. Um, Paul is a movement ecologist, he's a strength and conditioning coach, he's the performance director for the Netherlands Federation for Baseball and Softball, works with elite level professional athletes. Um, that's a very brief little rundown. Uh, Paul maybe you can take a couple minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself and also a little bit about the uh, ultimate instability that you're yeah, repping there as well. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sonny. Yeah, yeah so um, basically I'll start with a little introduction of how I actually got into it. Uh, I also was a, like an average athlete myself, uh, but I was highly motivated and dedicated and uh, always trying other things and new things and exploring and developing. Um, so that's how I also got fascinated for strength training from a, quite a young age. Um, and it was a logical choice for me to, to go and study human movement. And here I was really fortunate to got lectured by Franz Bosch, who uh, we'll talk a little bit more about later, I think. And yeah. uh, But he um, it turned out to be like my mentor. Uh, and of, of this day, he still is. And we work a lot together as well. Um, then during, uh, at the end of my study, I did an internship in Sydney uh, at the Olympic Institute. And here I was really... Uh, fascinated by the world of elite sports and I thought wow this is what I want to do uh, and actually uh, it, it was a like a dream come true like as an athlete I always aspired to the Olympics and but I quite soon noticed it's not gonna happen as an athlete not for everybody so <laughs> so then um, yeah I found my uh, role as a, as a coach but what I also noticed was that um, we very often train in, in, in this really like old school way, like everybody's doing the same exercises, the same reps, the, the same movement patterns. Uh, it's very like a mechanistic way of thinking, uh, like looking at a, at a human body as a machine. Uh, and I thought that should be different because like we're all a biological system, we are uh, uh, moving in an environment, um, um, and that's fundamentally like unpredictable, uh, dynamic, uh, nonlinear, uh, and there's so many different principles and things to look at than like looking at it like from really like machine-like approach, like uh, as if you're working in a factory doing the same thing every time. Um, and I saw a big gap within the world of equipment, the world of training, uh, how we actually train athletes and I was really stimulated by by Franz Bosch uh, to think outside the box and, and look at it differently uh, but I, I missed uh, ways to actually apply it in my in my training sessions so then I started to play around with more unconventional tools and I started to like be creative and and fix things myself and that's also how I started working with water uh, to get a like a dynamic load a dynamic weight uh, which actually fundamentally is uh, unpredictable and variable. Uh, so no repetition is the same and you automatically have to adapt to it. Um, but when I got back home um, and I started playing with it, I thought, wow, wh why is there not like a, a decent product that actually works and that actually is easy and that, that's, that doesn't break, like you're not gonna splash all the water on the floor if, if you <laughs> hit a... If you hit a like, plant pot. That's yeah, like, you need to, like I, I was working with PVC pipes and all type of things and it's all, like it doesn't have a nice fit. It's, it, it doesn't, it didn't do what I envisioned. Yeah, like not that built was, for purpose. Exactly, that was possible. So this is how like the first acrobats were born. Uh, because at that time also I started working as an SSC coach with uh, the Olympic athletes, uh, like the whitewater canoeing. And here I got inspired by the, like the rafting, yeah. whitewater rafting. And I thought, wow, if these boats are able to <laughs> go through the whitewater and hit rocks and like be so sturdy, durable, durable yeah. then uh, yeah, I can make some products of this as well. Yeah. Uh, and from there on it, it developed and more products came later and uh, like eventually I got a 
like a sport innovator award for the Hydrovest, like with patented uh, technology. Um, and I'll, I can explain more about that later as well, yeah. why we use that. Um, and basically, I, all the time uh, I was coaching. So I was, I was really stretching my own itch uh, and applying the, the things that I missed myself into my coaching. And it was like my field lab. Mm. Uh, and that's been like the past t- 10 years, like always like this combination of uh, coaching, uh, like educating and like entrepreneuring, uh, like with the things that I, I found in practice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've sort of covered there a little bit about how you got into it, where the ultimate stability uh, comes into this as well. Uh, you mentioned there you're working with the Olympic uh, canoeing team. You also work with the Olympic softball and uh, baseball teams. Now, let's say someone comes to you uh, or as part of their team, whatever, what is it? that's the first thing that you're then going to do in terms of your assessment with them, how you're going to carry things forward, what you're going to look at and what you're going to work on. Because from the sounds of it, one of the first things that you noticed looking at the Olympic uh, Institute when you were in Australia and when you came back is you don't want to do reps and sets of the same stuff, the same movements, the same patterns. So how is it you're going to go about assessing someone and deciding what path you're going to take with them? Yeah. So I think uh, the first thing, uh, if you gonna work with somebody for a long time, uh, the really first thing is look at the movement analysis from the sport. And I think this is the biggest missing link in most of the programs. Uh, because we've got all the specialties and everybody's doing their own tests and, and things within their own niche, their own specialty. But nobody's really zooming out and looking at, okay, but what is this person actually doing in the sport? Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of crazy that we don't do that in a better way and more systematic way. Uh, so what I mean with that is that if, for example, I see a pitcher, uh, I want to see him pitch on video, preferably multiple angles, uh, but really like game situation, full efforts, what's the the movement look like, What's what are his requirements. Um, and like, uh, then depending on the, the movement patterns, you can build a, f- a framework on how to analyze it, uh, also based on like the, uh, the system of Franz Bosch. Um, but from here you get a, a view of where the performance limiting factors are and where uh, possible risk for injuries are. Um, and the other thing is like actually talk with somebody. <laughs> Like I think in the age of technology, we often we want to do so many testing and stuff, but we forget just to look somebody in the eye and talk with somebody. Uh, and then as well, like if you hear from somebody like, oh, I always got pain in my back. Well, 90% of the time you can see it, you, you will see it in the movement analysis, like that somebody is not absorbing the energy well at that spot, not protecting the, the local tissue, not... Uh, tr- transferring and recoiling the energy optimally through the chain and so some, somewhere there's a leakage and like the tissue will get shear forces and will is not able to handle those and will at some stage uh, hurt um, so this is this is the link that should be there uh, and that's also I think the link between looking at it from a prevention uh, side and from a performance side like it's the same thing like it's a different side from the same coin um if you want to perform well yeah, you need to move well okay so then once you've got your analysis done from your film analysis and you're looking at that individual who mentions that they've got pain in x place now obviously you're you're looking at this from the strength and conditioning side from the movement side and and whatnot how do you then decide what to then work on what are the key factors when you look at them and you assess what's going on what are the key factors that you look at to then decide where you're going to take this that yeah yeah so back to the testing so i think there's definitely a value in doing like tests like range of motion tests mobility tests strength tests you name it 
but it only has value if you can put it in the context of the actual movement. So once you see the movement, you might see uh, a limitation in, let's say, the landing, and then you can find out whether it's uh, a mobility issue, a strength issue, or a control issue. Uh, but the other way around, it doesn't work that way. Then if you look the other way around, which happens a lot in, in most situations that I see, then you've got four different experts doing all kinds of different tests. Often they are not <laughs> communicating that well, so they're not having the overview of all the tests. Um, and even if they have, then everybody's second guessing, oh, it could be this, it could be that, uh, from their own expertise. Like instead of like looking at the movement and then putting it in perspective of the, the actual movement, what's actually happening uh, on the field. Um, so uh, th the way you move in a complex, high intensity situation, as in most of the, the sports, it's totally different in terms of uh, control and mechanics and what actually happens in the body as what happens in a... Uh, highly predictable, a low intensity situation, as in like in a physiotherapy room or a strength room. Um, so it doesn't tell me that much um, if I'm doing something in a low intensity, it doesn't tell me that much about what actually happens in a high intensity. Mm -hmm. um, and what you see in like complex movements, uh, looking at it like from a strength and conditioning side, uh, strength is almost never the limiting factor. Like somebody is very quickly strong enough, uh, but is he able to execute that in a highly complex movement pattern? Because now everything needs to work together in a highly synchronized way. Uh, like the smallest deviations uh, in the pattern can cause problems through the chain. Um, and so the, the limiting factor is not strength, but often it's stability. So stability is really, um, for me, a leading point to, to look at like the movement pattern, I'll look at, at the stability. Um, but it's not the stability that most people think about as they hear stability, because I think very often we've got old concepts of of stability, like a more like a mechanistic, static thing, like uh, how long can you wobble on one leg or something like that, you know? A lot of people, if you talk stability, they have this, this picture in their head. And that's not the type of stability that I'm talking about. So what is the stability that you're going for then? So it's uh, the stability within the dynamic system. Uh, and that's multi-layered. So for example, uh, a movement pattern can be stable or not. So basically we always move from a stable state to another stable state. So if we are walking and we're gonna ramp up the speed, then all of a sudden there is a transition to running. So it is a transition from one stable state to the other stable state. And that's called a phase transition. And there's nothing in between. Like in between there's a highly unstable space. So that's also why speed walking is the most silly, stupid thing there is <laughs> because you're kind of overriding all your system uh, feedback <laughs> that's telling you stop, start running, start running yeah. because uh, your energy levels shoot up like your uh, uh, local tissue, your, your muscle tissue is working out of their optimal lengths. They cannot recall the energy anymore. So normally, and there's been a lot of study on this, if you put people on treadmill and you're going to ramp up the speed, like everybody has a same breaking point where all of a sudden they're going to move into Turn running. Over into running. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's not happening on a conscious top down level. Like it's happening subconscious bottom up because the, the local muscle tissues start, the contractions become unstable hmm. and then they, they tell the body to move to a different state. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the way how like movement works. So it's looking at at the at the system like a dynamic systems perspective, and then looking at at it from movement pattern, the, uh, the stable states, and then within the movement pattern, what are the stable states within uh, that pattern that needs to be right? 
So every movement pattern also you can break down in smaller uh, pieces uh, and look at it at a smaller level. And this way you can like zoom in all the way to the actual muscle tendon unit, the, the, the function that happens on a contraction level. Okay, nice. So would it be fair to say then mm. some of the main principles that you're taking into account uh, are, or one of the key principles that you're taking into account is aside from strength, that movement pattern stability and the moments in the stability where when you're addressing the movement, those breaking points, and these are the aspects that you're then carrying forward. Yes, absolutely. Okay. What other principles do you then carry forward into your training programs? Obviously, you mentioned use the Franz Bosch method and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, like the, the Franz Bosch method, it's, I think... A really good framework for the movement analysis um, because if you look at it I think there's n nothing in the world that matches it in combining both the the science aspect of it and the like the practical what's actually happening in reality um, so I think he did a, a terrific job in in gathering a, as broad as possible this perspective of the the science and, and looking at it through the lens of anatomy like really looking at it, how is the body built? So h how does the body move uh, move well in its capacities? Uh, so this is a basic framework, but then like we made it our own. So we looked at it, for example, in baseball and softball, like hitting, uh, pitching and sprinting. Those three, we've got our framework. Um, yeah, and, and, and basically you can do that for any sport. So that's that's definitely one principle. Um, yeah, other principles is it, it's basically working on this, like building on it forward. So having this uh, dynamic systems perspective. Um, so it's also, for example, if you look at learning, like learning is not linear, it's nonlinear. So learning can happen in an instance, like if you've got an aha moment, all of a sudden you you got it. Yeah. Uh, so in the way we address our our, our program, uh, like one of the principles is that like learning is messy, learning is nonlinear, learning is chaotic. So then you need to facilitate that. You need to create an environment in, in which uh, the athletes are encouraged to learn. Um, that also means they are encouraged to make mistakes, which is very counterintuitive to what actually happens in the world of performance because you need to perform. You are not allowed to make mistakes. Mm. And often in the, the old model, it's even like athletes are afraid to make mistakes because then they lose face or they m uh, might... Uh, uh, yeah, they... They, yeah, they lose face for the, the rest of the group. Yeah, they might lose their place in the team if also, the mistake's big enough in training. Yeah. 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 So, but actually, if you don't allow yourself to make mistakes, you never learn. So you, you always stay within your comfort zone. You never stretch really to push those limits further. So that's one big thing that we put in our uh, program uh, to create this environment that, that's optimized for learning. Okay. And... How is it that you're facilitating that learning? What sort of feedback methods do you use for your clients if you use feedback methods at all? And yeah. Yeah, so the best feedback is always learning from the experience. So it's implicit learning. Um, learning because you do something and then you get a result from it. So it always needs to be connected to a, a good result. So if your um, outcomes of the movement are not clear, like your, your goals of the movement, your results of the movement are not clear, also learning won't be clear. And this goes back to every exercise you do. So if you do a certain exercise, let's say a high pull, the, the end result of the movement is not really clear. Like when is it right? If you lift it up to your chin, if a little bit lower, if your elbows are up or lower, it's not really... You don't feel it. But if you do a clean, you feel that if you've got a good catch, like you've got a, a solid landing, you feel whether you did a, a good repetition or not. Mm -hmm. 
so th- this is a big uh, decision factor within the programming. So I always go for exercises that have clear end results. Uh, and if I see a good mo- movement or a good exercise, but the result is not clear, then find ways to to improve that and make sure that the result becomes clear. And that can be like using targets to which you move, uh, uh, using uh, output, result output, uh, using um, double tasks, all, all those things. Okay. So that's, uh, I think, believe the most fundamental thing because that's how an organ- organism learns. Like I just turned uh, a father, I got a little baby. Like they're not learning because you tell them, oh, you need to move this, you need to move that. No, they just, they are, in the beginning, they're moving spontaneously. They don't even are aware of their own arms and legs. Yeah. They just randomly, <laughs> they go all over the place. And then because of this, at some point, they start to notice, oh, wow, if I do this, then uh, I feel this or I, I'm, I get a noise. So they get this feedback. This feedback. And then they start to, it's an emergent property. So then they self-organize into, oh, wow, uh, I can move this way. And they are interested in certain objects, so they're going to move towards that object. Uh, but not because somebody tells them to do. And actually, this never changes. But somehow, as soon as we learn language, then uh, we like to start using that. And I think often as a, uh, as a coach, that's also the hardest thing because you can see what's happening. But now the trick is to find a way to let the athlete feel what needs to change and feel what's happening instead of telling it. Because the biggest problem in in athletes uh, and in coaching, especially in our society right now, is we are in our head, we are thinking all the time, and now we are shutting down like the actually the intuitive capacity of the body to feel and to to move more freely from it. So now if I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to give all internal focus, oh, you need to bend your elbow, you need to do this, I'm going to screw it up even more. Like I'm going to put all this input in the, in the system, uh, but I'm giving input on, on the action. You need to move this, you need to move that. Uh, so I'm like ghost riding on the nervous system because I'm always moving from intention to action. And now I'm going to give feedback on the action. So now... <laughs> Like you get a kind of a brain crash. And yeah, there's too many things for the body to yeah. and for the mind to then yeah. try to factor it. Yeah. I think, uh, especially when I'm with my patients as well, that's one of the hardest things where, where you're saying that this is one of the big things that's happening. That's one of the hardest things to to kind of get over that, giving internal focus cues, especially when you're, you're first learning and developing your own way of coaching someone as well. Are there any kind of tips that you can give to to someone, regardless of the sport they're working in or the patient population, the client population that they're working with, of how they can then work less on internal cueing and internal focus and more of expanding that? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Create feel. Um, So the body is not interested in... Uh, postures for example uh, because there's no feel like I my body doesn't really feel the difference between here or there like like between it like a little different angle or something yeah and that's the thing that physios often are queuing on right like oh, you need to be a little bit there a little bit that and uh, nine degrees of abduction yeah, and yeah. externally rotate please thank yeah, you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but the, the the patient doesn't feel it and in particular an injured patient because the whole nociception and the whole proprioception it's all off uh, so <laughs> we, first we need to start with creating feel and actually uh, especially if if it's out of whack with somebody so you need to increase uh, the factors that create feel and that's playing with forces because the body feels different forces so if you have somebody and you say okay let's Keep your arm in, in one place and now you're gonna push against it in one direction um, it's predictable like very quickly i know okay i need to resist and push back so i'm training agonistic antagonistically the the muscle whether which direction i'm i'm giving the resistance yeah um, 
And then the more unpredictable I'm going to make those forces by quickly alternating like different directions of... Uh, Where that in, uh, yeah, manual, external force is coming from. Yeah. Uh, then it becomes more unpredictable. So the athlete or the client cannot longer uh, top down control it by just saying, okay, I'm going to resist against it. But now it 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 needs to work through the decentralized mechanics, so the, the co-contraction, so the, the underlying muscles that actually interact together uh, in order to keep it on, on one place and stabilize it. Okay. Um, and that way you create more feel uh, and you are training those fundamental uh, requirements of stability uh, in a more local decentralized way. Okay. And, and that's also the, the principle of uh, why I love to work with water. Yeah. Because this way also you got a dynamic load and you create feel. If I'm not going to uh, move the, the aqua back up and I'm in this balance and one side is lower than the other side, I automatically notice that the force is going to change because all the water goes to one direction. So now I don't have to tell somebody, oh, you need to lift your arm higher. No, the person is going to feel it. So creating feel is, uh, I think, the most important thing to do in order to get away from all the telling, all the the, like, the internal focus. Do you give any uh, cueing feedback at all? Do yeah. you utilize it much? Yeah, I think the only, f the most important feedback to give is uh, encouragement. So Fair just <laughs> well done, uh, keep it up, good work. Um, and like manipulating tasks. So if you, for example, do a certain exercise, uh, like let's say you do a, a hip lock movement, so you're standing in a s split squat position and all of a sudden you, you move up in an a, a explosive way, like with a, a cross extension mm -hmm. reflex. So one side is flexed and the other side extends. Mm -hmm. So basically to a, a toe-off position and running. Yeah. Um, then if you see that somebody doesn't is a, is not able to keep the attention on the full chain and loses the tensegrity and uh, is not able to maintain stability in that toe-off position, you can, for example, tell, okay, now take this uh, aqua ball or take this dumbbell and while you do the exercise, you move it up above your head as high as possible uh, and keep it for two seconds before you land your foot on the, on the bench. Mm -hmm. So then you're not telling them uh, you should extend your ankle more. No, you give them, you change the task. Um, then you see different things and you say, okay, now I try to hit my my hand with the, the driving, driving leg yeah. while you, you move up. So you give a different task to get more explosive drive, for example. Okay, that's well. Now step a little bit back. Uh, and do the same thing. Okay, now start with the plate uh, diagonally uh, beside your uh, standing leg. Okay, now take a different object. Okay, take a different box. And and this way, you're it's it's an ongoing process, and you can you can increase your learning potential like rapidly, immensely, because in 15 minutes you can go from the most basic, stupid, silly exercise to a quite advanced exercise because every time you hit the right buttons and you increase the learning process like tenfold okay. instead of staying like with this simple thing for two weeks and then move to the next thing for two weeks and then move to the next thing. Yeah. And Spending uh, yeah. two weeks to focus on the extension of the ankle or the yeah. extension through the hip. Yeah. You've just completely changed where that person's focus is and let the rest of the movement almost spontaneously occur exactly by them figuring out that hey in order to press the weight above my head or to go from down by my side to above my head i need to bring my body up right which also exactly. means it's going to happen anyway in the exactly. rest of the chain exactly yeah. and it happens all subconsciously within the body like this is that self-organization like bottom-up influences if you hit the right spot like uh Franz calls this like uh, the the gang leader, 
Like, hey, if you've <laughs> got a few bandits that do wrong th- stuff within the body, well, if you take the gang leader, like the rest follows. Uh, yes. So if you focus on the right thing, like the the other things automatically self organize to fit that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. That uh, as you were saying that, um, a lot of my colleagues have studied at the SOMT and they use the Franz Bosch uh, method of things, and I see a lot of what you're saying and what they're doing, where they've completely changed the focus. The exercise has changed completely, although the underlying principles remain the same and the outcome for the patient is so much clearer and quicker than if you like you say you spend two weeks hammering in the same concept the same idea it can be solved within a a few minutes almost yeah definitely definitely and um yeah it's kind of a little bit like thinking upside down if you've been thought in this really classic mechanical way Mm. so then it sometimes takes some time to change that that paradigm um but it's so worth it uh because all and and that's like one thing sometimes from the outside it can look like oh isn't that dangerous to do this um but actually if you look at it it's it's less dangerous than the other things that are happening Mm. so for example like in rehab Uh, very early on you can start with those isometrics that i was explaining like with uh adding up like the unpredictable forces because there's no local movement of the tissue so you're constantly training those contractions but there's no actually uh, movement Uh, so then they're not having to uh, contract and and lengthen and 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 change and 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 all that Um, so i dare to say that that might be more safe than actually starting with a low intensity movement in the full range or for example if somebody has a a running related injury like very often like in in old paradigms of rehab we start with jogging at some point that means that actually we're going to load the tissue like 10,000 steps for example Mm -hmm. and very often in a bad coordinative pattern so it's much smarter to turn it upside down and and start improving that work on that coordinative pattern and if you establish a good pattern uh, start to do that on a high intensity but w- with a very low volume and then when everything is good at the end of this the thing you you start jogging huh. so it's al- almost like in a in, a, in a reverse way in some ways yeah so that kind of brings us nicely into how much does the sport specific training factor into it and what do you do for sport specific training i mean it's quite obvious from the initial breakdown that you gave us that you analyze the sport that the person does how do you factor in sport specific movement into their strength and conditioning work into their yeah yeah program yeah so basically everything we do we we look at it through the lens of how does this affect the sport so always looking at this like transfer of training so if i do something how does it transfer to like improved performance in the sport um that being said uh, also one of the goals for our athletes in particular like the talent program also is to uh, move to the states uh, play abroad um, and i don't know what kind of program they will roll into when they get there so another goal also is just to be able to move well in whatever the exercise is. So I want all my athletes to be able to do Olympic lifts, to to master like the, the squats and deadlifts and all that kind of things. Uh, not because I per definition think that they really need those exercises in that volume, but if they are going to be exposed to it, I want to be able, I want them to be able to execute that right. Like that being said, I also th- think there is a value of lifting high loads uh, in terms of muscle recruitment and uh, firing and all that stuff. Uh, um, but in percentage-wise, I think to give a rule of thumb, I think 70% of what we do is really clearly transfer of training uh, related to the sport and 30% uh, 
is more Slanging general. Slanging and banging the, the heavy weights. Yes, yeah. it's, it's more general stuff. Um, and that's also like a lot of athletes, like they just love it, like they become addicted to it. Uh, so I think that's a big, a big danger of, of heavy weights. I think in the if you starting out, like you gain a lot of positive effects from lifting heavy. So uh, that's definitely, definitely true. But very quickly, like the law of diminishing returns, you actually you don't get that many positive effects anymore, and actually the negative effects become bigger. And that's the thing that often in SNC we don't look at that well. So we're looking at all those potential positive effects. Uh, if you are stronger and you jump higher, then you can perform better in your sport. But we forget to look at the potential negatives. Oh, if I'm going to lift heavier, it means I'm more fatigued. Uh, I got more soreness. Um, I, uh, th and I might perform less in another training or I need to s skip another training. Um, and we really need to look at, at those negative effects as well. Um, and, and that's always like the, ba the balance. And I think it's really important, like the more you can eliminate potential negatives, the better. Um, because that's often where a lot of harm is done, that uh, we actually don't factor in those, the, those negatives good enough. Okay. How is it, or what is it that separates you and your programming then from uh, Joe Blogs up the road then? How is it that you factor that in? What do you do when you factor that in that separates you, that makes you different? Yeah, so if we do uh, a more normal lift, <laughs> um, almost always we combine it in super or triple sets with transfer exercises. So if we do like a regular squat, um, first of all, like movement quality is first, but if we then like move them up more heavy, we'll always combine it like with, uh, for example, also like a hip lock movement and an exercise to reduce muscle slack uh, uh, to counter those negative effects. Because one of the big negative effects of heavy weights is that in sports, you need to, it's all about muscle slack. Uh, it's, everybody talks about rate of force development, but rate of force development, actually you can look at it, and if you look at it more closely, uh, it's totally different if you have to perform really quickly in a sport without any external load, compared to like moving in a gym with a heavy load. So if you train rate of force development with heavy loads, it doesn't mean that you transfer to moving uh, quickly without heavy loads. And this has everything to do with muscle slack. So if uh, I'm in a, in a normal state, like my muscles are like dangling and they're not on tension. And if I'm going to move, I first need to bring up the tension before I can actually perform the movement. Mm -hmm. And thi this can be done in a few uh, ways. Um, Franz Bosch and Bas van Horen wrote a few nice articles about it as well. So we can put them in the show notes. Um, but I can make a counter movement. So that's basically what I do with a, if I'm jumping, I I what's the first thing you see people do? They're going to move down to move up. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually doesn't make any sense because you lose a lot of time and you give away cues of what you're going to do. So that's a thing that you want to eliminate as much as possible within most of the sporting movements. And ways to do this is um, you can use a heavy load because if I have 100 kilograms in my back, now all of a sudden I need to build up this tension. Uh, but the weight's helping me with this. So actually, if then I move on the field without the load, I, I can become lazy because I'm used to building up all this tension because of the weights and I need to work against the resistance. But now all of a sudden I don't have that resistance. So I actually can become sloppy and lazy by having too much heavy weights. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I uh, use uh, perturbations and I use instability, I, I use unpredictable loads, uh, then I'm training this co-contraction and I, I need to build up the tension without having a heavy resistance. So this greatly helps athletes in reducing muscle slack. 
Uh, and another way is to use pretension. So give exercises that build up pretension uh, and then you go. So that's basically like like you've got a catapult, you uh, tension it and then boom, you let go. And this is something you see everywhere in nature. Like if you see a panther uh, going for its targets, like or some wild cat, uh, like they're gonna build up pretension, sit back and then boom, they go. Uh, you see with a mantis prayer, a prayer mantis, or yeah, name it. They're all pretension and go. So that's another way to train that principle. Uh, and the third is uh, add time pressure. So if you have less time, you automatically need to increase code contractions, build up tension, and go all of a sudden. So unpredictable forces uh, or perturbations, pretension, and time pressure. So that's why I called it like the three P's for training co-contractions, pretension, time pressure, and perturbation. Okay. And the perturbations, I assume you're bringing in the aqua bag for yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. But also elastic bands, uh, manual stuff, uh, yeah. un unpredictable tasks, uh, um, yeah. variability in the field, like different things, yeah. Okay. So then let's let's take the example that you gave of of jumping. Uh, you move down first before you move up. You're loading the muscle. You're bringing on the tension. So, how is it that you're going to then work to reduce the amount of preload essentially that this person is doing to produce a similar result under uh, bigger time constraints and whatnot, so that they can transfer that into the field? What sort of activities would you be doing with this person? Yeah, that's basically everything around those three P's. So in an exercise, can you do an exercise, uh, for example, uh, having an aqua bag, uh, going down into your loaded position and then all of a sudden, bang, you need to move up without moving down anymore. So, and, and this you can build into your training. Uh, or for example, take a, a small weight plate and instead of doing your your box jump, that's a, like a simple example also for the listeners. Um, so try to do a regular box jump, like you will make a counter movement. All right, then you're gonna tell yourself, okay, get rid of it, get your hands in the side, go down in, into your position and bang, move away. Then you can ask somebody to touch the shoulders. Uh, and now the task is, at the moment that you jump, you need to stay in contact with the other person having the hands on the shoulder. So now, if you're gonna make a counter movement, you feel that you lose contact. So you need to work against it. That's like a, a way to give feedback. Now take a, a little plate, take a two and a half or four, five kilograms plate, put it behind your head without touching it, go down and now same thing, like jump up. Now you only wake, will make the mistake once <laughs> because if you go down, you slam yourself in with the head. The, in the yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. You might have a headache for a few days, but that's okay. No. It's the extremes. <laughs> but no, but everybody all of a sudden they, they feel, oh, wow. Oh, shit, this is hard. Mm. In the beginning, they think, oh, it's a silly exercise. But now they think, damn, this is hard yeah. doing this. And all of a sudden their performance is, is, is dropping. So they need to go to a lower box. But very quickly, if you get these principles, you can actually jump just as high in this position as you can w w with using your arms and having a counter movement. And and that's that's a trick to get those principles in as many exercises as possible, as much uh, sport related as possible. Okay. And coming back to that Franz Bosch method then, uh, Obviously, this is something that helped create the base for you to work from. What exactly is that system? Um, and why is it that you would recommend to someone that wants to get into this world to then look that up? Like you say, it's got the anatomy and it's got the science, the literature and stuff. What is it about that system compared to any other that you think is um, yeah, so forward thinking and useful? Um, what is it? Yeah. Um, what it is like the starting point is the movement analysis so that's also like his last book uh, Anatomy of Agility really dives deep into the movement analysis uh, and it, it basically shows how those generic principles of movement exist whether you're 
play tennis or baseball or soccer, uh, whatever, rugby, those underlying components are the same in every sport because we all we all move, we all have a body, we move in an environment with a task and and like the task and the environment constraints, they change. And because of that, like the movement organization uh, will change as well. But those underlying principles are the same. And as soon as you get a, an understanding of those underlying principles, yeah, it can dramatically help you in in your exercise selection, in your programming, in uh, like making it in your individualization, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and that's the thing what makes it so st- what makes it standing out from a lot of other things is that all this knowledge um, is really useful. I mean. Uh, I also did my master's in strength and conditioning in London uh, and I learned a lot of it and I think it's really good like to dive into uh, all, all the research and, and, and like follow your interests and, and go deep in whatever corner you want to <laughs> search for. Yeah. Uh, but this provides like a, a, an overlapping thing. Like a, he, he's kind of, he, he takes the work away for you uh, like a little bit. Like mm. Um, he's done all the hard work so you don't yeah, have to yeah. yeah and i think there's nobody in the world like if you look at his background he used to be uh, a pe teacher uh, and uh, like a track and field coach uh, but also a, uh, an artist like he he was a painter so he has great paintings and he he did a lot of anatomical painting and he became anatomical illustrator as well so his uh, foundation of anatomy is at such a high level uh, and this way to think creatively so besides all the uh the science parts he also has the the art parts and i think this combination is uh is what you need because if you only go from the science you're only looking at the things we know then you're stuck within like the uh, an old paradigm and you're moving you're moving forward uh, really slowly because oh no I first need to make sure that we know this from science so then like you're five or ten years further on the road so, but he looks from outside of it uh, so he did a lot of uh, assumptions and estimations like based on what for him was like intuitively common sense well the the body's built this way so it makes sense that we need to move this way and now, like the science is showing up a lot of those things. Like if you look at the, the way muscles function and hamstrings function, he very early, he, he talked about th- like that the muscle fibers actually wants to maintain their optimum length around like isometric conditions. They don't want to move uh, too much because it's a highly uh, energy cost costing and it's very unstable because you've got so many muscle fibers. Th- um, you very quickly lose uh, contraction stability. Um, And now, like all the science is showing up on that. Like we we find a lot of how the muscle tendon units work uh, that links into this direction that indeed, like the muscle fibers want to maintain in the optimum length and the way that the, the fascial system is able to to absorb and transfer uh, that energy, um, so that's pretty cool to see. Like uh, looking at at the past and where we are now. Um, so yeah, I think that's what what makes it stand out comparing to other uh, methods. Okay, so I to to attempt to to. St- summarize that it's more so looking at it from an outside the box approach to your general what you read in the textbook uh and it also factors in the way that the human body has been designed to move but it's not sticking to that uh in an absolutist way because you also mentioned the fact that you want to look at how people move and everyone moves differently and you want to analyze these different movements right you're not sticking to the biomechanical principle of 
X moves in Y way, so every movement must be in Y way. Right? Yeah, and there are more abstract principles. So it's it's like like if you look at a, a complex system, uh, very often like you don't see from the outside like the the order and the the principles that are underneath, like that are underneath it. So and he really looks at the the abstract principles that are that lie underneath it, and um, like if you look at the the classic textbooks because everybody what we did like the reductionist way we cut everything up and we look at at isolated parts so we're going to study an isolated part uh, and then we think if we have all the separate parts that then we gain an understanding of the whole but that's actually not the case because at a higher level if we look at the whole there are different things happening because we got emergent properties and we get self-organization so uh, the whole is moving very different than the separate parts. Um, so we need to look at the interaction between all those parts. So we need to look at the patterns. We need to look at the systems uh, instead of only looking at the parts. And like, if you look at a simple thing like muscle contraction, everybody knows uh, actin, myosin, but we've got this really 2D picture in our head. Well, actually, we we have like the muscle. It's not a two-dimensional object. It's like a three-dimensional object uh, moving through uh, space-time. So, like moving in like the fourth dimension, and it's changing like constantly. So it's hyper dynamic, and it's so different than just like a two D moving in and out thing. But that's the, the the image that people have in their head. Yeah, yeah. and I suppose that also comes across for a little bit on how how we've been taught leading up to this point right and again i suppose that comes back to what you said at the start where we're taught things to fit in these little boxes and there's box a over here and box b a mile down the road and there's no bit in the middle to join the two and create that happy medium yeah absolutely yeah nice so Again, we've we've spoken about cueing and ways that you can change the focus of an exercise. Um, what other tips would you have for someone? We've spoken about Franz Bosch in terms of programming or in terms of guiding exercise. Are there what are the three most crucial factors for you when someone does that? Yeah, so I think the most important thing is uh, appreciate the complexity of the human body and what I mean by this is that like we cannot just make it more simple uh, than it is like it is very complex uh, we can distill like simple rules and, and abstract principles that uh, that help like navigating but the human body is complex the whole process is complex so embrace that complexity uh, and it's okay to not know and to have to deal with a lot of uncertainty so for example that's one of the principles also like in programming like approach it more like the weather like yeah we know that we've got different seasons uh, but even now with the most high advanced technology we're still not able to uh, to forecast the weather like w one day or uh, yeah. very precisely yeah we were meant to have a storm for the last two weeks and it only turned up in the last two days maybe exactly yeah. exactly yeah. so how in the hell then we think that we can do that for our athletes if we not even with all the nasa <laughs> equipment we can do that with the with, with the, the weather, weather. Yeah. like a human body is just as complex as the weather uh, if not maybe even more complex yeah. uh, in some ways so um yeah we need to get rid of that idea that we can plan everything to the minute and to the to the millimeter uh, ahead so then find simple rules that that help you uh navigate and and that you build in into your programming build in stability and flexibility at the same time okay uh, so another principle like use your intuition that's something also very often we thought not to use it because everything we need to be able to give you a clear explanation of how to do it uh, well actually if you're coaching in the moment and you use your intuition you use all the information that you get from your body and your experience and everything you you, you build up uh, and you make choices that maybe at the moment you're not able to 
really pinned down. But if you zoom out and look back, then you know, oh yeah, that's why I did that. But allow yourself to use your intuition. And if you're a student and you're just starting, you need to build that intuition. So g give yourself some time. Like you, you need hours, hours, hours of of investing in yourself in looking at movements, seeing movements, working with athletes, uh, try things yourself to build that that base to to then work from. Um, so that's also, I think, an um, important principle. Okay. It it's mind blowing to me sometimes when I see physios or trainers that have little to no experience in the gym. And one of the things you just said there at the end is try things yourself. How important do you feel that is that if you're coaching, training, whatever, rehabbing, how important do you think it is that you have that experience? Yeah, very important. Like, of course, empathy, empathy also helps you a little way. But uh, I mean, as soon and everybody knows this, like if you have experienced a certain type of injury, you'll have be far better in tuning in with your client with that type of injury because you know how it sucked to train like for a year and rehab and all those things that that play in and the feeling that it has and, and you know what um so and that's with everything like if if you don't have that experience some way or another it's much harder to really t tap in and 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 get that uh so yeah i really encourage people to yeah have skin in the game and uh like go after it yourself as well also because then you are a much better role model and people will take much more and better advice from you okay. um yeah so for sure how important do you think it is then that you have played the sport that you're working with as well do you think that's something that is a hundred percent necessary that you need to have done it at a top level or do you think that having some experience in the sport is okay or yeah where do you lie on that yeah so i don't think you absolutely need to to play that sport like for example i've never played baseball myself but i did play track and fields so basically all the movement patterns from baseball uh, like running throwing jumping uh, a lot of them like you have them in track and field as well only like the more the the game side and maybe the interception part of the the other player the, uh, you, you miss that but so there is a lot of overlap so i think it definitely has value if you have that uh, but at least have some experience in in it like it can be like a different sport as well i mean as soon as you get those principles and you build this this feel you also see that everything is movement so you see uh it doesn't matter if it's rugby or baseball, uh, you can analyze and you can work around it. And uh, along the way, you can uh, learn more about the sport as well. So you definitely, if you don't have experience with the sport, you need to invest a lot in it. So I, I spent heaps of time like watching games and talking with people and to understand the game a little bit better. Uh, also for my own convenience because otherwise it's boring as hell if you, <laughs> <laughs> you know nothing about what yeah. you're watching yeah, yeah so yeah. now uh, i actually can enjoy it uh, if i'm uh, watching it so uh, i think it's it's very important okay one of the things i think that a lot of people see especially now is the instagram coach and one of the things that you see a lot from your Instagram coach is uh, this using a perturbed surface under high load, high tension. So they, I've genuinely seen someone on uh, uh, a BOSU flipped uh, curve side down with 80 kilo or 100 kilo on a squat bar saying that this is going to help someone improve their sport performance. Now, me personally, I'm all for using the BOSU, using the aqua bag and using a perturbed surface, but I don't do it under high tension, high load is that for me is where I draw the line in. This is one becoming unsafe and two, where you've already mentioned when you're on the field, there's, there's no hundred kilo on your back. Yeah. So where do you stand on something like that? Yeah. I mean, that's very stupid. And I think 
like it basically are two things that you're talking about. One thing is uh, like the, the Instagram stuff. Uh, indeed, like now, if you are, for example, you're a model and you've got a six pack, you can become a, a good coach. Yeah. Like, and it, it's total bullshit because it, it just doesn't work that way because you miss out, like obviously on a lot of knowledge or whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of, it's like outside in behavior. Like mm. we we'll look at how does it look from the outside instead of like going from inside out, um, what uh, should I be doing? And maybe I need to do an exercise that doesn't look really fancy, uh, but that is way better than doing some exercise that looks really fancy and now I get a lot of likes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and and that's another thing, then people are gonna copy that exercise while maybe that that's an exercise that's really specifically for that one person that, that really needs that, that thing. Uh, so an exercise that might be good for person A might be devastating for person B. So it's the worst thing there is like to just go and copy an exercise somebody else does. It's the worst thing you can do. But then about like the content of what you're talking about with the, the Bozu ball and stuff, you always need to look at, and there comes the movement analysis again. So where is the, where does the perturbation take place? Like very often, for example, the, the surface is stable, but I get uh, an un- instability or a perturbation from outside because somebody is hitting me or because I need to react on things that are happening on the field. Uh, so then what's the sense of wobbling on a, on a bozu, not being able to maintain uh, proper alignment and, and proper uh, form and proper intensity and, and whatnot, uh, if actually on the field that's not the limiting factor? So you always need to look at what's the limiting factor because maybe for somebody who's doing surfing, uh, that might be good to do like all kinds of exercises, uh, jumping on a reverse bozu and, and doing things on there. Um, so the thing like where do I put the perturbation is really important. And in most cases, I need to make sure the, the most perturbation comes from outside the body and from top uh, top down instead of like from the the ground from the surface hmm. uh, so that's uh, so that's one thing and also like with heavy loads because I see the same things also like with using elastic bands and having weights on there like as soon as you you use heavy loads you all are already limiting uh, the movement pattern like now the load is going to dictate your direction basically hmm. <laughs> you have to go down because of the, yeah. the yeah. gravity is pulling you down like the, the weight is pulling you down so from a coordination s- standpoint it actually makes the exercise more easy because it l- already limits a lot of uh, options that are available um, and often I'm not able anymore to perform like complex movement patterns so then the question is what's the value of it and then if I also going to add perturbation within that pattern uh, now going to be very risky but because you can get all kinds of spinal problems and you know what. So you're taking a lot of risks. Well, actually, you don't get the benefits from improving that complex movement pattern. Mm. Okay, nice. So actually with perturbation, perturbations, you, you need minimal loads because the, the movement is already very complex and, and uh, at, a, at a high speed. So even like if you're, for example, you're running and you do a sprinting, drill and now you're gonna rotate with a, a weight or if you're really good you're gonna use an aqua bag and do exercises like skipping sprinting exercises with with the bag um, the forces are already really high be- because of the the intensity and the the movement you're performing at so if you now shift like f- five kilograms uh, and you have to maintain your pattern like the actual impact load on your trunk or your abdominals uh, can be massively. Hmm. Uh, so you, you don't need big loads. No, you don't need a hundred kilo either side of you. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, and yeah. that's and that's another thing. It's uh, what shoots my mind now is uh, we look at it this, in this linear way. Like, okay, I've got hundred kilograms, but actually, what's the the lever? Uh, I mean, if you've got a, a plate in front of you and you do an exercise and then you press it out, like it changed ah. the, the the local load on the local tissue. Changes Massive. dramatically. Yeah, yeah. So how can I program this? Okay, I'm using five kilogram. 
I, I never know what actually what the load is on the local tissue. It's very hard to know uh, yeah. that with every exercise you do. So you can get rid of that. Also in, in your programming, you can get rid of uh, being very fixated on, on the actual load because that's just one factor. Uh, there's so many ways to overload the system. Okay, nice. And how do you then factor in injury into your training when you're dealing with players who come to you with an issue now if it was joe bloggs coming for a general training session there's a difference then not prepping for a game i haven't got something the coming weekend how are you then factoring in into someone's program if they've got an issue let's say a pitcher has a shoulder problem and they've got to play this come in week once or twice in the week how are you factoring that into your programs um yeah it's a good point like if somebody has to play then i think okay why do you need to play at what level like is it the world cup okay maybe you want to take the the, 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 risk. the risk or um but then uh you need to be very pragmatic so i've i've had people with like minor injuries or uh, things and we were able to build them up like in in one or two weeks uh, to be game ready uh by not looking at but by really going from day to day and looking at uh what are you able to do um and then build it up like w within the constraints and, and build it up so for example the shoulder okay maybe yeah it's a good example i got somebody who had um uh, pulled his shoulder out of the socket uh, on on the base like first baseman like somebody hit it um a very muscular guy um and it was out for two hours before they finally <laughs> were able to get it back in Jeez. how did we build that up like we started locally within like very limited range so just beside the body okay the things i just discussed like isometrics uh like add more Small perturbations then at different angles like and within a week he was able to get into back into like 90 degree angles and different angles but still like isometrics um then uh like add movement to it uh okay at at higher impacts to it and then pragmatically you can because you follow like every day and you you check okay what's the reaction and you make a stepwise progression so you, you're not going to add two different stimuli at the same day because then you never know what causes the the reaction yeah. and then stepwise and like within two weeks he was able to play again wow. uh, yeah and that's like very quickly and uh that was possible probably also because he just is a very quick responder and was really dedicated in 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 his uh exercises but it kind of shows that if you're pragmatic about it and always go look at the function uh, look at the function look at the pain and move then move in a stepwise progression building up those coordination patterns from local to more uh, intermuscular to more global to more total patterns okay nice that you build from the inside out yeah and what would you say uh would be some of the biggest learning moments that you've had when working with your clients in terms of something's happened and either it's gone the way that you wanted or it went the way that you didn't want things to progress and you saw that and you thought okay in future if i come across a case like this again where i'm working with a player who has this i know that this is the steps that i need to take instead yeah i've I think that yeah, there's so many learning moments. I think yeah, if you open to it, to it, yeah, you can learn every day massively. But one big learning thing was like in this interdisciplinary approach, the importance of speaking the same language and being on the same page, like with your team. Uh, and that again, I think that the framework that France offers works really well because now everybody can talk from the same framework and everybody can bring in their own knowledge and their own experience. but at least we also talk the same language. And that's the thing that I've noticed in the past very often with people who were really resistant to change. They just wanted to do things their way. And I, this is how we do it. And uh, uh, this is uh, scientific and this is the best and whatever. 
uh, but there was no common ground, no overlap, no uh, ability to speak the same language. Well, that makes it basically impossible to to get the best for your athlete. Uh, and I've seen a lot of uh, rear processes really been disturbed by lack of communication, either because like you got a physio on the national team and you got a physio at the club, and maybe the person also has his private physio and his private trainer. So you've got all these people involved, mm. where half of them are invisible because they're not on the map, yeah. and the other half they're not talking to each other because they are like competing or they somehow not collaborating. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, yeah. it it just doesn't work. So that's the thing, like the importance of being on the same page on the same side with the whole staff. Uh, so that's also why I prefer to have a physiotherapist in our team, like on board uh, and like sit on a regular base, uh, discussing case studies, exchanging information and leave the ego at the door. Mm. Because it's not if I'm going to present to you something that I think is of value, I'm not doing that because I think you are stupid and you need to do things differently. No, it's just like from an honest perspective, we want to increase the level of, of the team and improve everybody uh, and you can have your opinion on it what do you think of it uh, present your stuff you know but very often you see that people if like ego comes in or people feel uh, frightened of, of, of their position uh, of um, their way of doing things and yeah, then you can get really strange behavior uh, so that are like if I think a few of my key learnings Nice. I like that. And have you got any sort of reading recommendations for anyone listening, uh, whether it's studies or books where someone can brush up on this sort of stuff? Yeah. Now, so obviously I've said it already sometimes, but the Francis books, definitely recommend them if you haven't read them. Um, also in Dutch, um, I wrote a, a three a series articles on how we apply like this dynamic systems approach in baseball. So that's in Dutch, sorry, English people, English speaking <laughs> people. Um, so that's a nice one as well. Um, like from a more basic perspective, if you want to understand dynamic systems a little bit better, I also really recommend uh, the work of uh, Fritjof Capra, um, like a book, um, A Systems View of Life or uh, A Web of Life. Uh, like he's a, a physicist, uh, and he, um, uh, like, he really explains in those books, I think in a very good way, like the whole science behind dynamic systems and how, like, the, the, the physics of living systems and how this is different from, like, the Newtonian physics. And a lot of what we do is still based on those Newtonian physics and then we miss out a lot. So he's done a terrific job at that. So I also recommend that. Okay. Um, where can people find you if they want to find out more information about you or about the ultimate instability aqua bag stuff? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul Venner uh, or Ultimate Instability. Uh, also Twitter, um, Facebook, but not that active there. Um, like the, the website, ultimateinstability.com. Um, and there are also. Like we, we put on like some events that we do uh, via social. We always put out the events. Like if you subscribe to the newsletter on the on the website, you also stay tuned for latest updates because there's quite a lot of things coming up. So that's really exciting. Um, and also like paulvenner.com is my personal webpage. I'm not really active there, but if you want to get contacts, you can go there as well, or LinkedIn. Or, okay. Well, I'm um, easy to find, I think. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Paul, look, thank you very much. Really appreciate you being able to get down here and have a chat with us. And uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. Was Any fun. last little bits that you want to say to the listeners? Well, if you think this is interesting, uh, stay tuned for the physio tutors as well, because uh, we're going to uh, make a nice uh, e-learning module on like the whole dynamic stability stuff. So um, maybe you can already subscribe for that somewhere. Absolutely. <laughs> Get yourself um, registered. A quick uh, overview of what that's going to entail um, for us. 
Well, basically, like a lot of things that we talked about here, so really looking at what's stability from this dynamic systems perspective, and how can you improve it like on on many different levels. Okay, grand. Well, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.